All an albatross really wants out of life is a full belly, a devoted mate, and a chance to reproduce. The tick wants the same, but it requires something else first. It needs the albatross, fully, intensely, and desperately. The tick initiates this one-sided relationship as it pursues its biological mission. The albatross simply gets itchy. This is the story of a community of tiny, blood-sucking pests and the gangly but powerful seabirds they exploit. Two remarkably different creatures on parallel missions of survival. Wherever an albatross goes, whatever success it might achieve, the stowaway ticks reap the benefit. Albatrosses, being seabirds, come ashore only to breed. When they do, ticks await them, finding shelter on the bird's downy, waterproof feathers. Whatever a tick lacks, it steals from the albatross. Though it measures only two and a half millimeters, its design is both magnificent and monstrous. 25,000 times magnification reveals a devilish combination of claws and jaws. Eight spiky legs and two body segments put ticks into the same category as spiders and scorpions, a class called the arachnids. Its beak-like mouth can penetrate flesh with ease. Its spikes and barbs enable it to cling mightily to its victim. While many arachnids seek insects and other small creatures, ticks pursue bigger game. They're not in it for the kill. They want room and board, and eventually a place to raise a family. The albatross, like it or not, fills those needs while trying to raise a family of its own. The Laysan albatross nests on Midway Atoll in the Western Hawaiian Islands. Its kingdom of the air covers the vast central Pacific Ocean from the Western United States to Japan. Its powerful glider-like wings span more than two meters. They can carry the bird on its 3,200 kilometer journey at a speed of almost 500 kilometers per day. While the albatross commands an ocean, the tick rules over a few centimeters of crumbly beach sand. It moves fitfully and without grace. No one admires the lowly tick, and yet perhaps it deserves admiration. Despite its apparent inadequacies, it manages to get where it needs to go. Somehow, it can catch a bird hundreds of times its own size. This one succeeded by pure chance, thanks to a clumsy landing. At the beginning of the breeding season, albatrosses need to relearn how to land and navigate on the beach after months at sea. Unfamiliar with the air currents and laden with a full belly, the bird awkwardly makes its way to the nesting ground and becomes a tick magnet along the way. Nature has made parasitism a common, if ill-respected, state of affairs. This kind of exploitation doesn't come easy and has its risks. But once the tick colonizes the bird, almost nothing can shake it. What a tick lacks in mobility and size, it makes up for in patience and dogged determination. Ticks thrived on Earth long before the first birds. 
300 million years of evolution have honed their timing. Like clockwork each November, 300,000 nesting pairs of albatrosses flock to the far end of the Hawaiian archipelago, halfway between the North American and Asian continents. Instinct brings them here as it has for more than 100,000 years or more. The ticks have had plenty of time to synchronize their own reproductive cycle with the albatrosses. The parasite can find its host with its eyes closed, which is fine because the tick can't see very well anyway. Instead, it feels the vibrations of the bird's footsteps. It takes practice. The near miss almost cost this tick its life. As the birds settle in, the tick will get another opportunity to catch a passing foot, or it will die trying. Each year, Midway's Eastern Island and Sand Island, measuring only five square kilometers, become the world's largest nesting ground for lace and albatrosses. The bird's arrival creates a parasite's paradise. In the tall grass, the hungry ticks await the amorous albatrosses each season. The ticks will mate soon too, but they need a hearty meal to put them in the mood. Dinner is on the albatross. The parasites have a standing reservation. Millions of years ago, ancestors of the Laysans moved north from the southern hemisphere but failed to adjust their calendars. So the albatross is still mate during the winter months, which correspond to the southern summer. The birds come to court and breed on the island. The ticks stay here to court and breed on the birds. They don't make a move until the birds do. But mostly the bird's heavy breathing gets the ticks' attention. Ticks literally have smelly feet. They sniff with organs on their legs. The hallows organ samples the air for carbon dioxide and a compound called butyric acid. The acid, common in the breath or sweat of many animals, also gives rancid butter its sickening smell. For ticks, there's no finer perfume. They actively seek it out. Because the birds nest in the same spot year after year, the ticks merely await their return. They conserve precious energy by allowing their food to come to them. On Midway, the drama unfolds just a few meters from the islanders. The albatrosses offer more than a tasty meal. The ticks have exploited the bird's entire lifestyle to their own advantage. From feeding to mating to reproducing, ticks shadow the albatrosses at every turn. Love, albatross style. They mate for life and can live up to 80 years, making albatrosses the longest living birds in the world. The courtship, quite a vigorous contest, forges a lifelong commitment between the young albatrosses. The older ones have come to reunite with their mate. During the rest of the year, the couples live apart. The first one back to the island, usually the male, reclaims the nest and waits for its partner. All that time on the ground gives the ticks plenty of opportunity to catch an albatross. 
Just as ticks sniff out the albatrosses, albatrosses sniff out each other. Their unusually keen sense of smell enables them to identify their nest and their mate. As the lovebirds get reacquainted, the tick gets to work. Nesting within plumage, the tick bustles around in a world of soft down and warm blood. Its head, like a drill pump, burrows into the bird's skin. Sharp hooks in its mouth plunge more deeply to pierce a small blood vessel. The parasite wastes no time digesting its meal. Dissolved nutrients in the blood provide an instant energy boost, a tick's version of a double espresso. Maybe even better. If need be, one serving of blood can keep the tick sated for five years. But like a coffee addict, until it feeds, it has limited energy reserves and must work fast to hit its target. Otherwise, it could starve. Preoccupied with their mating ritual, these young albatrosses remain oblivious to the fact that a horde of hungry arachnids sees them as dinner. Like the albatrosses, the tick's ultimate goal is to procreate. To do that, they first must eat. A hearty meal jumpstarts the reproductive process. Albatross blood makes the best aphrodisiac, at least for a tick. It aims for where the down is thin, the base of the legs, the head, or the rump. A lost feather might mean losing a tick, but the parasite will have a chance to colonize another victim. While the returning albatross pairs recognize each other almost instantly, new couples meet at the singles dance. Their graceless nuptial ballet earned them the nickname Goonie Birds. Ticks come uninvited to the wedding. The tick gets ready to crash the party with a great, dangerous leap. When it smells a host nearby, it lets go, an acrobatic routine without a safety net. Missing its target two or three times could deplete its energy and spell its doom. Starving for blood, the tick won't survive until next season. The ticks that manage to catch an albatross also invade its home. Season after season, the albatrosses work hard to prepare their nest for an egg. From the time the egg is laid to the time the chick leaves, almost eight months will pass. The ticks take total advantage, living a plush life in the albatross's cosy, down-lined home. They become the ultimate party crashers, the uninvited guests who refuse to leave. Ticks, of course, don't just attack albatrosses. About 800 species of the predators thrive on all continents and most islands. The nest also hosts other parasites. Blood-sucking flies. And mites. The electron microscope reveals how easily their claws can manipulate the pointy spikes or barbules on the edges of the feathers. They can navigate perfectly through the fluffy and difficult terrain. Like rampaging robots, the parasites dig their way toward the succulent flesh.
While they feed, the birds breed. Laser and albatrosses don't mate until they reach eight or nine years of age. Once the egg is laid, they'll take turns in the nest. The female sits for two or three days, then the male replaces her for about three weeks until she returns from foraging in the northern Pacific. The cycle repeats until the chick hatches. Because they raise their chick together, they require strict devotion to each other. Parasites remain devoted to the albatrosses too. The nest, designed to hold the baby bird, will also cradle the next generation of ticks, if the adult tick can manage to survive the preening ritual. The feathers and the nest swarm with profiteers. Harmless mites join the welcoming committee. They eat only dead skin flakes. Albatrosses spend about 10% of their day tending to their plumage. As they groom, they pick off some of the riffraff. That helps keep the population in check, which benefits everyone, bird and pest alike, because if the host dies, the party's over. One of the albatrosses' neighbors has evolved a drastic way of avoiding nest parasites. The white stern simply doesn't build a nest. Its eggs lay precariously perched on a branch or a rock. Baby sterns live at the mercy of high winds or a clumsy movement, but at least they're safe from parasites. For a while, anyway. Even though the species lives at sea and rarely sets foot on dry land, eventually and mysteriously, ticks find the stern chicks. For creatures with such small brains, ticks certainly have the world figured out. The name of the game is survival, for ticks, for sterns, and for the albatrosses. The nest builders prepare for a new family member, and the ticks get ready to start a brood of their own. They couldn't do it without the albatrosses. Even a cold-blooded parasite deserves a warm meal, not just for herself, but for her offspring. This gluttonous tick has put on some weight. Both male and female ticks invade albatrosses, but only the females feed until they're bloated. Ticks have a complicated sex life. Before they can breed, the females must consume an enormous quantity of blood. An anticoagulant in their saliva keeps the wound flowing providing hours of leisurely dining. The blood provides energy for egg production. When the tick can't swallow another drop, she releases her hold and plops onto the ground. The male tick, a real stud, lives only to provide sperm. In exchange, he might get dinner, sucking some of the blood out of the female tick. Then the little mister goes on his heavy date.
For male ticks, certainly, size doesn't matter. For the females, quantity counts. Her lust for blood is matched only by her lust for males. Over one or more days, she'll mate with multiple partners. The male, after impregnating as many females as he can, leaves the encounter completely exhausted and totally obsolete. Depending on his species, the tiny gigolo may crawl off to die. The female finds a safe place to stash her progeny. She may lay more than 10,000 eggs at one time. Then she abandons them and in most cases dies as well. The albatrosses take a different approach. Unlike the ticks and unlike most other birds, they lay a single egg each year. Both parents dote over their precious egg for months. Then they'll care for the chick until it can fend for itself, three to five weeks after hatching. Tick after tick continues to breed during the prolonged albatross mating season. The bloated females drop out of the feathers and into the nest. Their offspring will inherit the family business. The albatrosses and ticks are perfectly in sync. Both have laid their eggs. In about 60 days, the nesting ground will crawl with albatross hatchlings and newborn ticks. The next generation of parasites won't even have to leave the albatross's nest to get its first meal. A parasite that manages to leave the nest usually departs on an albatross. After laying her egg, the female entrusts it to the male and sails away to gather food for the coming chick. Because the breeding ground lies so far from their northern feeding area, the albatross must cover great distances quickly. While most soaring birds catch updrafts and thermal currents, albatrosses harness the wind's changing speed as it blows across the ocean's surface. Using this technique of dynamic soaring, she can span huge distances without flapping her wings for hours or even days. Superb geographers, albatrosses can navigate the 2,500 kilometer trip between Hawaii and the Bering Sea with ease. Some have made non-stop journeys as far as 6,400 kilometers to gather food for their chicks. They find abundant food in these cold waters. This female's hunting range follows the Aleutian Islands, which connect Alaska and Siberia. For three weeks, the female will eat her fill here, then she'll switch places with the male. The Laysan albatross trolls the frigid ocean for fish, crustaceans, squid and krill. To feed, she'll float along until she can snatch her prey, taking her passenger with her. That's the price the tick pays for trying to steal a seabird's blood. For the hungry wanderer, a flock of fulmars means the promise of a good meal. Today's lunch special features cod. 
The smaller fulmas wait for the albatross to peck open the stomach of the fish to feed the crowd. Though albatrosses can skillfully pluck squid out of the sea, they will just as easily settle for garbage. But this meal holds no interest. Meet the hungry seabird's best friend, a fishing boat. Americans, Russians, Japanese, Chinese and Koreans fish these waters. The birds let the fishermen do the heavy lifting for them. These halibut fishermen throw back great quantities of entrails and half-consumed bait. For the seabirds, it's like fast food. Many birds enjoy scraps as an occasional treat. Some albatrosses might trail a fishing boat for days. The fulmers outnumber the albatross, but the albatross is a bigger bully. Tucked within the albatross's waterproof plumage, the tick hangs on. Most parasites can endure all kinds of torture to stay with their host. The mighty mite has what it needs to survive and won't budge. The tenacious parasite takes only one or two breaths an hour. A dunk in the sea is no threat to the tick, as long as it keeps its grip on its host. Even underwater, it might survive. If need be, it can hold its breath for a week or more, but it would ultimately starve to death without a host. The raucous, ravenous birds burn a great deal of energy in these mealtime tussles, though the food is plentiful and none will go hungry. Soon, the feeding frenzy ends. After all the pushing and jostling, the birds settle down or fly off to hunt elsewhere. They leave behind a flotilla of feathers, pulled out during the squabble or carefully preened off. Completely at home on the open sea, the albatross rests. It may sip seawater to quench its thirst, doze a bit, or peck at a small passing fish. An unlucky tick, however, finds itself completely out of its element. Its safe, warm-blooded universe has collapsed, leaving only a damp feather in a vast ocean. 
but ticks are patient pests. Favorable currents changed this one's luck. There's land nearby. The tick washes up on one of the Aleutian Islands. It made the 2,500 kilometer air and sea journey from Midway relatively unscathed. This bloodthirsty Robinson Crusoe now faces a dilemma. It can fall into a state of lethargy while waiting for an albatross to arrive and risk never waking up. Or it can try to sample the local cuisine. These bald eagles could make a good substitute host. The birds certainly smell good enough to eat. They exhale the carbon dioxide and butyric acid that wet the tick's appetite. But eagles aren't albatrosses. They behave entirely differently. Ticks can't walk fast. After generations of preying on albatrosses, the parasite must change its tactics for this strange new prey. Its survival depends on it. Unlike albatrosses, eagles don't nest on the ground. Catching one presents a challenge. The eagles that land nearby don't stay long enough for the tick to get a foothold. Even if it managed to board an eagle, life among the birds would be catch as catch can. The breeding cycle of the tick doesn't match the eagles. The tick might dine well, but probably could not find a suitable mate among his new hosts. The parasite's chance of soaring with the eagles looks slim. Back home, on the Midway Islands near Hawaii, the ticks fare better among the nesting albatrosses. It takes about 65 days for a Laysan albatross egg to hatch, and when it does, the chick depends fully on its parents for 165 days. It will also be at the mercy of the parasites. The nest crawls with hungry and expectant pests. Generations of ticks, including newborn larvae, young nymphs and full-grown adults, live jumbled together. Some adults begin to awaken. Others, gorged with blood, are on the verge of laying eggs, and others have already laid them. Still others are out for blood. Parasites tend to congregate on the head area, where the bird can't scratch or preen them off. Though the tick's movement through the feathers can torment their host, their bite doesn't hurt, thanks to an anaesthetic in the saliva. As the incubation progresses, so does the infestation and the itching. The albatross can definitely feel the ticks as they crawl closer to its flesh and swarm through its feathers. The male, sitting sentry over the egg, can't get up to preen or scratch. Other albatrosses lend a helping beak. The bird's patience will soon be rewarded. For the albatross, it means a new generation. For the ticks, it means a new meal for their own offspring. Way up north, back on the Bald Eagle Beach in the Aleutian Islands, the castaway tick faces a bleak situation.
The climate doesn't suit our marooned little parasite. It prefers to find shelter from the rain so it won't get washed away. Days pass and the weather clears. The tick can emerge now, but fewer and fewer eagles come to the island. In their place, ravens land on the beach. They bring more bad news for the tick. Ravens are even harder to conquer than eagles. They're swift, unpredictable, and always on the move. Nature has not prepared the tick for this energetic prey. It has little opportunity for climbing onto the ravens. Meanwhile, it grows weak. On this island, the raven has the home court advantage. As the bird picks through pebbles and seashells to find insects and crustaceans, the roles of predator and prey get reversed. For the hapless tick, the chance to start a new colony ends right here. Back on Midway Atoll, the breeze kicks up and the clouds darken. The male albatrosses welcome the change in the weather. For the two weeks they've been brooding, they've gone without food. A little water on the beak is pure pleasure. Not so for the ticks. Each raindrop crashes like a waterfall, carrying it away from its prey. The smart ones cower deeper into the plumage to escape the deluge. The male bird sits the storm out. He has depleted much of his fat reserves waiting for his mate. The storm passes and the nest dries. Nearby, the tick eggs begin to hatch. In their earliest or larval stage, ticks have three pairs of legs. They'll feed, then they will molt, shedding their skins to become eight-legged adolescents, called nymphs. After another meal comes another molt, and they reach adulthood. The entire process takes about three months, depending on heat and humidity. The ticks begin to hatch before the albatross eggs do, part of nature's plan for tick survival. The male albatrosses become agitated. Their long wait is almost over. The chick struggles to break out. The tiny bird comes equipped with an egg tooth, or diamond, that helps crack the shell. The tooth falls off later. It could take a chick two to six days to escape from its shell. The ticks arrive too, but not to help. For a hungry tick, hatchlings are a delicacy. Thin-skinned, young and tender, with no feathers and little down to have to contend with.
and they come packaged in a cosy nest, sheltered from all danger. A parasite couldn't ask for finer dining. Born with a bloodlust, tick larvae scurry for a meal the moment they hatch. Albatrosses have the longest incubation and chick care cycle of any birds. The hard work pays off, giving them the highest survival rate, no thanks to the ticks. The famished larvae storm the plumage and join the adults. The females that began their mating cycle late continue to feed. They plunder the energy of both the father and the chick. At the end of the picnic, the larvae leave the feathers and head for a safe place to molt. The quantity of abandoned molting shells or exuviae gives some idea of the extent of the infestation. An adult albatross can harbour hundreds of ticks on its body. In these cases, the ticks create extreme discomfort and can pose a real health hazard, either through disease or more rarely blood loss. Up to 20,000 ticks have been found in a single nest. Besides being uncomfortable for the albatross, the parasites pose a danger to the chick. Despite the parent's devotion, the invasion can force it to abandon the egg. The bird's own life is at stake. The parasites become victims of their own success, driving off the host they depend on for survival. In a sense, they've killed the goose that laid the golden egg. On rare occasions when conditions allow the ticks to thrive too well, up to 95% of the eggs and chicks can be abandoned in that season. In another nest, a chick waits for his mother to return with food. A delayed meal can have serious consequences as the ticks suck the hatchling's blood. Drained of its strength, the chick will likely die. Its father, also waiting for a meal, has no food to offer. Blood loss is only one of the ways parasites kill. They also carry viruses and bacteria that decimate the babies. The adults, after waiting so long for their chick, must leave its remains behind. A precious breeding season has been lost.
Back on the Aleutian Islands, a female albatross starts the return journey to her nest. She has spent time foraging and pre-digesting her chick's next meal. She must hurry before her chick starves. With a full stomach, she can make the trip non-stop in a matter of days. At the nesting site, the male has waited weeks for this moment. His mate has finally returned. But now, perhaps he has his doubts. He has grown overprotective of the chick he worked so hard to incubate. He won't let its mother near it. A custody battle begins as the chick starves. At last, the father relents and the chick gets its long-awaited meal. Eagerly, it laps up a paste of regurgitated, pre-digested fish concentrate. It may eat until it can no longer move. Now that mother has returned, dad gets to leave the nest. He'll fly off to forage and provide for the chick's next meal. Breeding season has ended and the birds have gone to sea. The nests will remain empty until 300,000 nesting pairs of albatrosses return to breed and be infested once again. A new generation of ticks replaces the old. With a belly full of food to last the rest of the year, this one leaves its host behind. Carefully hidden, it will begin a period of slowed biological activity until the albatrosses return to breed again in about three months. When the cycle begins again, the tick will have to find a new host to prey on. A young, black-footed albatross has landed near its hiding place, rousing the tick from its slumber. The new season has already begun. The tick must act fast, claiming its prize before time runs out. A black-footed albatross will serve it just as well as a laysan. Both species breed on midway, and the tiny bloodsucker can't afford to be choosy. This young mount made an easy target. It was still in flight school. The tick had no trouble climbing aboard. It brought its own crew along. This parasite has parasites of its own. One day, 
the albatross and its stairways fly off on a maiden voyage to meet their destiny. The trip is a short one. Ending in the jaws of a tiger shark. Like any parasite, ticks benefit from the success of their host. They also pay the price for failure. But do not underestimate the tick's tenacity. Albatrosses sometimes feed on shark carcasses. Perhaps, just perhaps, the tick survived and hitched a new ride.